Hi everybody, this is the first lecture for unit number two, so things that will be on exam number two. And we'll start with experimental research. We'll have that lecture in a bit. Uh, it's a pretty long lecture in the sense that uh, experimental research has a lot of topics. That's a major methodology in uh, psychology. So uh, just a quick note uh, that with the experimental research lecture, there's a lab exercise that goes with it. And the lab exercise is lab exercise number two. It's going to be due Wednesday, June 23rd. So if you're watching this lecture on time and you're watching this during week number two, that's the Wednesday of the third week of class. And then also there's something that's listed here. Chapter 11 is listed here. Uh, mainly focus in on writing the introduction part of that chapter because as you're reading the annotated bibliography and just completing the annotated bibliography, you should be thinking about uh, how that stuff can inform your introduction. And so in terms of that, uh, if you go to the textbook, chapter 11, you see it says present, presenting your research. I suggest you could look at the APA style. It's probably good just to sort of get a sense of the APA style. You'll probably look at that again. And then uh, section 49 which is in chapter 11. Uh, you can see here that it uh, goes over the parts of a research paper. And I would strongly suggest uh, reading the introduction part. So there's a section here about the introduction, the opening of the introduction, the literature review, which you're doing or have done, uh, I shouldn't say have done, have started with the annotated bibliography. And then the closing of the introduction. And then it goes to the method. You don't have to read the method yet. So read that part of the chapter uh, about the introduction, and that will help you uh, write your uh, introduction based on your literature review that you're doing, uh, starting with the bibliography. So let's go ahead and get started with lecture number two. I'm sorry, lecture number two. Unit number two, lecture number four. And so this is on experimental research. So again, this is a, a major methodology in psychology research and a major, major methodology in a lot of different disciplines, uh, scientific disciplines. So there'll be quite a bit to cover here. So this will be a bit of a long lecture. Again, you can take breaks whenever you want. Uh, if this lecture is continuous uh, and, and long, you can take breaks whenever you want. And just to sort of start us thinking about, well, what can we do as experiments in psychology? Uh, I want you to watch uh, two famous experiments in psychology. So watch these videos. So there's a video on uh, Darley Latine and a video on Ash. Uh, if you click on a link in, or cut and paste the links from the PowerPoint, you should be able to open it in your web browser. So go ahead and watch these videos. OK, you should have watched those videos. And I'm going to the next part. So what makes an experiment an experiment? So there has to be a true IV. What does that mean? So IV stands for independent variable. You should have learned that in your stats class. Um, but basically what a true IV is, it's something that the researcher manipulates systematically. So I used this example before, but it's a nice convenient example. So if I think red makes people more attractive or attracted to people. I can have the same picture of a person and I can make sure I can Photoshop it and it, they will appear in a red shirt and then the very same picture I can make it into a blue shirt. And <clears throat> I'm going to do a simple design. I'm going to have half my participants see the person in red, rate their attraction. The other half of my participants, I'm going to have them see the person in blue and rate their attraction. And if I'm right that red produces more attraction, 
then the average attraction ratings for the red group should be greater than the average attraction ratings for the blue group. So I systematically manipulated red or blue. Whether somebody saw red or blue, I systematically manipulated that. That would be an example of a true IV. Uh, so sometimes the word independent or the term independent variable is used too broadly. Um, and so an IV is really only when you manipulate something. <clears throat> if you're not manipulating something, then it's called a predictor variable. So I talked about this, I, I believe, before, uh, thinking about the red versus blue thing. Uh, let's say I think that there's a personality variable that influences people's attraction to other people. And that personality variable is social sexuality. How much do you think about sex? How much are you obsessed with sex, et cetera? Um, so I can actually measure that with a questionnaire. There's actually a validated questionnaire for that, by the way. Um, so I can measure that. And I can see if that thing, that variable, influences attraction ratings. That would be a predictor variable because I'm not manipulating that. I'm not making people more or less sociosexual. I'm simply measuring it. It's something that they have in their personality. They bring it to the experiment, but I did not manipulate it. So things that you don't manipulate but influence the DV, the dependent variable, the outcome, in this case the DV is attraction, so if there's something that you're not manipulating that you're measuring and you think it's going to influence the DV, that is a predictor variable, or PV. Uh, and the one issue with a, a predictor variable is that sometimes there can be alternative explanations. Um, so um, predictor variables we're not controlling, so uh, some people will say that it's going to be harder to make cause and effect conclusions based on predictor variables because you didn't systematically manipulate that. <clears throat> All I'll say is that you can refer to one of our first two lectures where I go on about the uh, cause and effect debate. <clears throat> uh, and then um, we can actually create groups from predictor variables. Um, these would be pre-existing groups. Uh, so we could compare people who, for example, keep a diary and those who do not. So are they different on some aspects of psychology? Are they more depressed? Are they more anxious? Again, it's not necessarily a cause and effect relationship, but we can see that relationship between those variables. Uh, we'll get into this, I believe, later in the semester when we talk about what's called quasi-experiments. Um, sometimes you look at pre-existing groups where people have been assigned to different conditions in the real world, but it's not done through random sampling or random assignment. So it lacks the experimental controls that we want in our experiments in psychology, but there's some sort of assignment going on. <clears throat> and so an example of this is, let's say uh, we have neighboring school districts and they're, they're connected to each other. They're very close to each other. Um, they are on the border of each other. And let's say one school district makes a change in the curriculum and the other school district does not. Um, assuming that you know that the two school districts have similar demographics, similar income levels, these types of things that would not affect the, the results, we could actually do a quasi-experimental study to see if the student's learning is different in one school district versus another. It's not experimental because we did not randomly assign kids to the school district. We didn't do the manipulation, but it's something in the real world that exists, different groups that have been exposed to different things. And we could see if we can get some sort of conclusions about the curriculum changes. Again, that's quasi-experimental. It's not. I would say that's not a um, true IV because we're not manipulating that. It's just something that differs just naturally. And then we take advantage and we look at uh, any differences that might occur. And again, the big thing about experiments is they want to make a causal connection between the IV and DV. Um, and so that's a big thing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on in this lecture. <clears throat>
And again, I'll refer to um, lecture one or two, I can't remember which video. I went over quite um, quite extensively uh, the debate about the cause and effect links uh, for experimental versus non-experimental. But what I'll say is be careful because sometimes people play tricks with these things. Um, so, for example, the cigarette companies have been saying this for year for years. Um, no evidence. There's no evidence that smoking cigarettes causes cancer in humans. They were barking that for um, pro probably close to almost a century um, by now. I should say a century, probably 70 years uh, by now. Um, and it's true. Well, why is it true? Because we can't experimentally manipulate whether this person smokes and this other person does not. So you can't have a true IV. Um, so um, this statement on its surface is true, um, but if you look at the evidence, correlational evidence with people, there's a ton of evidence. And then if you look at, and you notice here it says in humans, <laughs> if you look at um, all the poor animals that were exposed to the smoke, so they did all this research with animals, and they were able to do it experimentally, manipulating whether an animal was smoking or exposed to smoke or not. And that evidence is overwhelmingly uh, causal links between uh, cigarette smoke and uh, cancer. Uh, but they're not humans, they're rats. So be careful about people who are walking around and saying things like this. You need to think a little bit more deeply about what it means. Um, they probably don't talk about this as much because they got everybody uh, vaping. Um, by the way, if you vape nicotine, uh, if you vape other stuff, uh, I think there's you have less uh, problems probably with addiction. But if you're va vaping nicotine, it's um, highly addictive. Um, it's a negative reinforcement. Um, and nicotine has a very strong cycle of negative reinforcement. And by the way, the nicotine is going to your receptors for acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, which is a very important neurotransmitter in your brain. Um, so you probably shouldn't be jamming something in there uh, that's not acetylcholine. Um, so I won't get into that because it's not about addiction, but if you're vaping nicotine or know people are vaping nicotine, get off of it as soon as you can, or otherwise you're going to be trapped. If you think you aren't addicted to it, uh, don't vape for 24 hours and see if you can do it. Uh, otherwise you're addicted and you are a, a pawn in corporate web that's making trillions of dollars off of your addiction. Not yours personally, but this generation's addiction. So true IV, so we manipulate we manipulate the level of the IV systematically. What does that mean, level? So if I, if I, basically my research question is, does color influence attraction? And then my specific hypothesis is that red produces more attraction than blue. So in that case, I have two levels of the variable. So color is the variable, and I have red is one level, and then blue is another level. I could also do three levels. I could do red, blue, and green. So if I had those three colors, that would be three levels of the IV. And the levels of the IV should be conceptually driven. So for me, I might choose red, blue and green because they they obviously differ in their color composition but there also can be um, bright colors it's not like I'm picking dull colors like gray or something like that I'm trying to say well I need to make a I need to make a strong argument about red so I, I can't choose dull colors that would be a I'd be kind of uh, tipping the scales to find the thing I want and I shouldn't do that I should try to find some things that can be bright some people think are pleasant, um, but doesn't produce attraction. That would be the strongest argument. Um, so there's another example here. So let's say that we have some sort of drug that we're testing. Uh, if we have two levels of the drug, it could be a placebo, which would be there's, there's something that the person takes or is given, uh, but does not have any of the medication in it. It's a placebo, but we do it because people think, um, if they think you're going to get better, you tend to get better. So we want to make sure that uh, you get better, not because of you are optimistic and hopeful now, but really it's the drug that's having the impact. 
So we might compare placebo versus 50 milligrams of the drug. That's two levels. Three levels would be placebo, 50 milligrams, and 100 milligrams. So these levels would be chosen conceptually. Uh, you know, and, some, and oftentimes they'll do this in, in medical research, I believe, is sometimes you don't know what dosage would be effective. So you might have several levels of dosages compared to the placebo uh, to see which level of dosage is optimal for the treatment of the thing. So that's a term that you should know is uh, levels of the independent variable levels of the IV. If we look at Darley's and Latinez experiment, there's essentially um, three levels that we saw in the video. Uh, I believe it was zero, two, and five other students. I'm not sure if they showed all of this in the video, but this is what they did in their study. So was, was there zero students, so you were alone? Uh, was there two other students? Was there five other students? And again, these are uh, chose conceptually. Uh, you know, how many people does it take? How many other people does it take to have that diffusion responsibility kick in? Uh, and for the ASH experiment, uh, there's there's something that they did is there's uh, three levels of confederates. So confederates are the other people in the room who are giving the false answer, but they're working with the experimenter. So are there two confederates with you? Are there four confederates with you? Are there seven confederates with you? So these levels are chosen to um, see uh, is there, where, where does conformity kick in, and is there a, a max limit? And actually, I think they, they also had other levels, so they went beyond seven. Um, and by the way, uh, you are a conformist, even if you don't think you are. Most people say, I'd never do that. Uh, I would never obey. Um, guess what? <laughs> The research strongly suggests 99% uh, of you would. Uh, so, uh, and it doesn't take much. And so from the ASH experiment, for example, we know it just takes seven people. It doesn't take 50 people. It doesn't take 100 people to get you to conform. It takes just seven people. That's it. And then you'll conform. Seven people around you. That's all you need. And that's that will max it out. That's the max level of conformity if you add 8, 9, 10. 50, it, it doesn't change, it's already maxed out. You're maxed out on your conformity at seven. And then there's um, two levels for the dissenters. So they had the manipulation of having zero dissenters and then having one dissenter. So there was two levels to that condition. And I don't know if they decided that um, they would just do that, but basically when you have one dissenter, it really breaks down the conformity. So um, they almost don't need to look at two, three, for dissenters because it just takes one. So that's the good news. So the bad news is that you are a conformist, 99% sure of it, and you would do awful things to people. The ASH experiment wasn't about awful things, but you would do awful things with people, uh, against people, against your morals, uh, with just seven people around or somebody telling you to do it. Uh, there's lots of evidence for that. But the good news is that um, if there's a dissenter, it'll break those things down. So. Um, that's something to think about, especially in our day and age where uh, dissenters in a group are oftentimes attacked. Um, and I think that's horrible. So um, that's some good news, that dissenters have a big impact. So some terms, and these are some terms, I believe, from your textbook. So single factor, two-level design. That just means that we have two levels. So if I have red versus blue. That's a single factor. Single factor means one independent variable. So my only independent variable, the only variable I'm looking at is color. Single factor. Two level design, red versus blue. There's two levels to my factor, to my variable. So factor is variable. This is one of the things I don't like about um, these things, statistics and, and methods. Um, we have like multiple terms for the same thing. Um, so part of the trick is just learning that language and understanding that it means the same thing, that factor means the same thing as uh, independent variable or predictor variable. Um, single factor, multi-level design. So single factor, we have one independent variable, so color. Multi-level, it just means we have more than two levels. So if we're comparing red blue and green, 
That's multi-level design. And in experiments, because people are seeking to make cause and effect statements uh, between the IV and the DV, so if you systematically manipulate the IV and you see correspondent changes in the dependent variable, then we have evidence for cause and effect. So if my group that sees the, red, the person in red has higher attraction ratings than the group that saw the person in blue, the same person, then we have some sort of argument about the IV causing a difference in attraction. But those statements can only be made if we have experimental control. What does that mean? Experimental control means that the only thing that's varying is our independent variable. Nothing else is varying. So how the instructions we give, how we talk to the people in our experiment, the place we do our experiment, they're all the same for the red people and the blue people. There should be no way that I act differently or present things differently or have them in a different room. Like you don't want the red people doing it in a bright, sunny, nice room and then the blue people are all down in the basement. You don't, you don't want that. That would be a, a horrible lack of experimental control because something's varying besides the red and blue that people are seeing. Um, and it's really important to do it in terms of the um, experimenters. So you don't want your experimenters who are running the study to know what's going on, or sometimes they kind of know what's going on, but you have to really train them. Don't act differently. Um, it, because sometimes experimenters can give cues to the participants about how to act. And that would actually be horrible because that breaks down our cause and effect arguments because other things are varying. If other things are varying besides color, in this case, then we don't know whether it's the color that's changing attraction ratings or whether there's something else going on that's changing it. So we can't talk about cause and effect if other variables are changing besides the color. And um, this is not statistical control, so you may have heard um, terms about controlling for this variable or controlling for that variable. Uh, that's that's typically uh, statistical control, which um, is a method I don't recommend. But basically what it says is that we know that there's some variance, um, some variable that could affect the DV, and we'll just pretend it's not there. Uh, so we'll pretend it's not there and equalize it, and then we'll do our stats focusing on just on the other variable. Um, I don't want to get into the details of that because um, I think it's uh, too detailed, too technical, but um, I would not recommend that. And also, that's what they mean by statistical control. So that's something different from experimental. Experimental control is actually what goes on in your actual study with your participants. And there's basically, there's, um, I was going to say two types, but really there's a subtype. So the broad term is extraneous variables. So if there's, if there's things that are varying besides the red and blue condition, if there's something else that's varying in our study among our participants, it's called extraneous variable. So extraneous variable is other things that are varying in our study that is not our IV, is not our red and blue condition. The worst type of extraneous variable, so this is a subtype of an extraneous variable, is a confound. A confound is an extraneous variable that varies systematically with our independent variable levels. So I mean, a really this would probably not happen, but a really stupid confound would be um, if you tested all your red participants, you say, okay, I'm just going to have a red picture in, in this room. I'm going to have a blue picture in this other room. I'll bring people into that room. And I don't want to change the pictures, and I don't want to get confused, so I'll just do it. I'll put half of them in one room, half of them in the other room. Um, if you, for whatever reason, have the red picture in a sunny, bright room that's nice, and a blue picture in the basement, uh, that would be a confound. 
So red and blue are varying, yes, but systematically the red people are in a nice little room, sunny room, and the blue people are in a, in a dank basement. Uh, the, those conditions of testing are probably going to affect people's behavior. So that would be horrible because a confound, because it systematically varies with your independent variable levels, you don't know what's causing the outcome. So uh, you, for example, could get really high scores for the red and really low scores for the blue and say, oh my gosh, I've, I have evidence that red causes so much more attraction, but maybe it's just simply the people that were in a nice bright room were in a better mood uh, and they just gave a higher rating because they were in a good mood because it was a nice room. And then the blue was lower ratings because people were depressed and they wanted to get out of there and they they don't really have a positive outlook because of the room, and so they give lower ratings. So maybe it was the room that caused the behavioral difference in attraction ratings, not red and blue. So confounds are really, really dangerous because of that. You can say something's going on when there really isn't. So in terms of experimental control, a big thing that we do is we want to make sure our procedures, our testing conditions, how we interact, our instructions, all of these things are the same for every single person regardless of which level they're in. And therefore the only thing that varies is our independent variable. Another thing we do in terms of experimental control is we do what's called random assignment. So this is sort of a similar concept as random sampling. Random sampling remembers that everybody in the population has an equal chance of being selected for your study, to be a participant, to be in the sample. Random assignment is similar to that, but random assignment is the assignment to the level of the IV. So if I have red and blue as my levels, each of my participants has a 50% chance of being in red or blue. It's random. I randomly assign people to the level of the IV. Why do we do that? We do that because this helps control what's called participants variables. So anything that the person brings into the study that could influence the findings, if we have a large enough sample and we do random assignment, it should equalize those things. So for example, um, you know, we talked about social sexuality. Um, so we know that that's, that probably might affect the uh, attraction ratings of people. Um, so uh, we could actually measure it, but a lazy way would be to not measure it and just simply randomly assign people. And if we have large enough groups, the average social sexuality of the red group should be equal to, roughly equal to the average level of social sexuality for the blue group. So that variable should not influence our findings because on average, our groups should be equal if we do random assignment. There's, there could be a ton of other things for participant variables. So uh, sometimes I talk about picky versus not picky people. So uh, you might know some picky people. Everybody's a two in our world. Everybody's a two, and if they're really generous, you're a four. Uh, and then there's not picky people. Everybody's an eight and nine. You know, oh, everybody's cute. Everybody's good looking. So we know that there's individual differences in pickiness, if you will. Um, so if we do random assignment, the average level of pickiness for red should be the average level of pickiness for blue if we do random assignment. And there's a ton of other things, too. So we've been sort of talking about personality variables, but it could just be simply uh, the mood the person in, is in or some, something that has happened. Um, so, you know, when you do relationship research, your fear is always you're going to you're gonna get people who just broke up with somebody and they're going to come in in a really crappy mood. Um, and then vice versa, you have some people who just fell in love with somebody and they're just, maybe they're too idealistic about it. Um, so that probably would affect attraction ratings too. So, you know, some, some people may have just broke up with somebody. Some people just fell in love. If you do random assignment, those things should be equalized across between the red group and the blue group. Or just even something that's not relationship, just a good bit day or a bad day. So, you know, some people, um, they're having a great day. Uh, if the sun is shining, 
Um, they found a $20 bill. Uh, you know, people are nice to them that day. Every they're you know it's their great day. It's a lucky day. And then there's some people who are having horrible days. It's it's raining. Their car broke down when it's, it's raining, and they had to go out and fix the car. And they're all soaked, and they they've tripped. And they stepped into a big mud mud puddle and soaked their shoes. And they come in and they're all nasty in their mood. Um, these types of things, if you do random assignment, they should be equalized. So any sort of experience, events, mood, personality that the person's bringing into the study that could influence the results should be equalized if you do random assignment. So I, I went on with a lot of different examples because I don't want to imply it's just like personality things. It could be many different things that can affect how people react to our experiment. And it'd be very difficult to predict and measure all of those things. And so random assignment is a good shorthand way of equalizing those things. <clears throat> and then there's this concept that extraneous variables are noise. So why is it called noise? It's hard to detect the effect of the IV. So if other things are varying besides the independent variable, it makes it harder to see whether that independent variable is influence the DV because there's so many other things that are changing and happening. And there's basically two directions, and you should remember this from your <clears throat> stats class, I hope. So there's a type 2 error, which is it makes it harder to detect. So harder to detect would be um, there's a lot of noise and lots of different things are happening and you're not aware of it. And so there, therefore, it might actually end up suppressing the relationship. So maybe there actually is a difference between red and blue, but so many things were happening in the study that were changing that you didn't know about. It actually made the two groups equal. When in reality, they're not really equal if you had done a really well-controlled study. And then there's a type 1 error. Type 1 error is you say, hey, there's an effect, there's a difference, but there really isn't. So the um, confounds are probably where uh, a big risk of type 1 errors are. So, you know, again, that sort of red people in a nice sunny room versus blue people in the basement. Maybe there's really no difference between red and blue. The real difference was because they were in a good mood in a nice room versus a, a dank basement room. You would run, you'd run around and say you found an effect for red versus blue, but in reality, maybe there's no difference, and you just simply made a type one error. And obviously, um, this noise um, is horrible because you end up making a false conclusion about the actual relationship between the two variables because you had some flaws in your experimental design. So in terms of controlling extraneous variables, we already talked about experimental control. Other ways that people uh, talk about this, including the book talks about this, and I, I differ from the book a bit, but I'll go over this and I'll say how I differ. So the book says, well, maybe sometimes you want to limit the participants because you think that differences in your participants is noise and that noise will suppress the actual relationship between your IV and DV. So you might limit the ages of your participants, the sexual orientation of your participants, etc. I strongly advise not to do that. So there's a huge downside. There's two of them. Uh, one is just uh, in terms of science, it limits, limits your generalizability. So if you limit your sample, you really shouldn't say that people are like this. You should say 18 to 22 year old white females uh, who are in a private college are like this. <laughs> that's because that's who you limited your participants to. And then philosophically, uh, I think this is also abhorrent because you start seeing diversity as noise. Um, so differences in people is noise that is going to suppress your relationship between your IV and DV. Um, and this is why I um, can be high, highly critical sometimes of experimental approaches, because in experimental pr approaches, there's often this obsession with, I want to 
maximize the relationship between my independent variable and my dependent variable. That's the only thing I care about. And in doing so, they ignore the reality of the real world or, or how things actually happen. So we talked already in lecture one or two that uh, they re sometimes they reify the variable. So they find a relationship and say, yes, this variable's the thing for this. Well, in the real world, there's so many other variables that are interacting with that thing. Uh, so we don't want to ignore that. And then here, um, we don't want to basically say we can only find that strong relationship between an independent variable and dependent variable if I start viewing differences in people, diversity, as a bad thing, as noise. Uh, I think that's a horrible way of approaching understanding people. So in my perspective, if your theory, if your um, research methodology only works under certain conditions, then it's probably not a very good theory. A good theory should probably apply to human beings, not just to some very small subset of them. And so um, your book does talk about this, and this, this demonstrates that the experimentalists think in this way, but I strongly uh, object to it. I think it's um, abhorrent just in terms of science and also abhorrent in terms of uh, seeing diversity as a uh, noise rather than something to understand. So if if your IV-DV relationship doesn't hold for everybody, then that's actually interesting to me. Why does that relationship hold for some people but not other people? So instead of ignoring or suppressing diversity, understand it. Why do people act differently in terms of these two things? That would be a very interesting question. Make sure I didn't skip anything there. And we already talked about the confound. So we talked about confound is a extradience variable that systematically varies with the IV. There are some uh, other examples besides the one I, I mentioned, which was sort of a design example. Um, so I did talk about this. I talked about acting differently to different groups. This is specifically called expectancy effects. So if I know that red's supposed to be more attracted to the person in, in red, and uh, I know blue's supposed to be lower, an expectancy effect is somehow I convey that to the participants. So um, if I think maybe they're going to have higher ratings, maybe I, I talk in a higher voice or something or more rapidly, like, oh, here's somebody, you know, can you please rate their attraction? Versus blue group, oh, here's somebody, can you please rate their attraction? You know, that sounds like a, a, a fairly subtle difference, but I would... I would probably bet the farm, if you will, the old phrase. Um, that instruction difference would produce differences in ratings of attraction. And we would call that expectancy effects because you can kind of see what I just did. There was an expectation. There was the first one, the red was speaking a bit more rapidly, a bit more high. Um, so it's like, hey, 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 I think you're going to do, you know, hey, here's somebody. You should really like them. And it was like, okay, okay, here's somebody. Um, I'm conveying my expectations about how they're supposed to behave. And there's a ton of research about this that it's this stuff is oftentimes very subtle. So you might think that it's not a big difference, but <clears throat> the research is pretty strong about this, is that those small subtle differences produce big differences in behavior. And it can even be nonverbal. Uh, so how you look at the person, how you are, hold your body towards the participant. Uh, some things that we're oftentimes not aware of uh, can affect the results. And there's a very famous study um, that even rats pick up on this. So there's a famous study, that, um, basically it's the same uh, rat or, or group of rats, probably different rats because a rat would maybe be too tired to do this too often. Um, but you know, have a, have, a, have a rat, I usually use one rat as an example. So this rat, and we know the rat, the rat's time in a maze, we know that. It's the same rat. And if we bring in different people, and for half of the people, we do this individually, so for half the people, we bring the person in and say, you know what, this rat is really smart. 
and I want you to time uh, him going through the maze. That's your job. And then there's the other half of people. You go, okay, well, this rat, um, we think there might be something wrong with him. He's kind of dumb. He's kind of slow going through the maze. Uh, we would like you to time him going through the maze. So it's the same rat, has the same ability to go through the maze. What they found was, and I believe they watched him, and it says things like don't talk to the rat or something like that. Um, but just those different expectations of the people actually produce different behaviors in the rat. And you can kind of probably predict how. So the people that thought the rat would be faster, the rat acted faster or was faster um, going through the maze. And those who thought he was dumb, the rat was slower. Um, so the rat was no difference. It's just that somehow people conveyed those expectations to the rat and it affected the rat's behavior. So expectancy effects are um, very possible and often subtle um, and very dangerous. <clears throat> Another example of a confound is um, non what they call non-random distribution among groups, which means like, let's say, for example, we were doing a task. Uh, let's say it's a, a learning study and they're supposed to do some sort of learning, learning task. If for some reason the IQ was higher in one of our groups versus another group, that would be a horrible confound because the IQ is higher and that's systematically varying with the level of the IV. Again, a uh, random assignment is one way to break this down. Um, you can also break it down by actually measuring the thing. Um, so if maybe you don't have IQ, it'd be, that's, that's a long thing to test, but maybe you bring people in if they're college students and ask them what their GPA is. You can actually get their GPA and double check, make sure the GPA levels are on average the same across your different levels. So sometimes we can measure something that we think is something that can affect our findings to make sure that um, they're not they're not uh, different across the two groups, not equal. And again, confounds are horrible because they really break down the cause and effect relationship because that confound could be actually the thing that's making the difference in the DV and it's not the IV. So um, confounds are really dangerous because we might make especially a type one error where we think something's going on, but it really isn't. It's the other variable, the confound that's producing it. There's also uh, this concept of treatment versus control conditions. So treatment is we're doing something that we think will change behavior. So let's say that I have um, a study technique that I want to see if it's effective for college students. The treatment condition would be the one that I tell people about the study technique and ask them to use it in the study. A control condition is without that treatment. So if I was doing that study, half my subjects would be told, here's a technique that you can use to help you with this task and please use it when you're doing this. So it's treatment. We're told them to do something different. We think it's going to help them learn. Control would be just, here's this task. Go ahead and do it. So just how people naturally do it so they don't have the treatment condition. So you can think about this in a sort of traditional medical research. There would be a treatment condition where you would give somebody the new medicine that you're researching, and there's a control condition where they would not get the medicine. So it lacks the thing that you think will make a difference. And typically what we do in experiments is that we have an alternative hypothesis, HA, alternative hypothesis, that the treatment differs from the control group. And we have one-tailed versus two-tailed test. So you should have had this in your stats class. Uh, but quite simply, one-tailed says that something is going to uh, be greater or less than in the other. So I'll do both, I think. So uh, let's say that I have that study technique. So I have that study technique. I think it's going to help people learn versus just what they normally do anyways, the control condition. 
So I probably want a one-tailed t-test. Oh, I shouldn't say, t yeah, it's a t-test, by the way. But a one-tailed test. So the one-tailed simply says, the people that use my new study technique are going to score higher on this task versus people who did not use the technique, the control group. So my study technique greater than the control group on the task that they're doing, the learning task they're doing. That would be a one tail. Two tail would just say they differ. My treatment group and my control group are, are differing. To me, a two tail test doesn't make sense in that case. Because if my treatment group came out to be lower than the control group, that does, that's not a that's not a good finding. That's not an HA that I I'm going to talk about. So, to me, whether it's not just not as effective as the control or it's less than the control it doesn't really matter. It's not good. So in general, I recommend one tail t test. Um, two tail I don't like also because um, you're kind of playing games and so. In my opinion, in psychology, I know that other disciplines differ, uh, but in psychology, we should have a theory that says this is the way that people are going to act differently because of this thing. And here's my reasons for that. This is why I think this is going to happen. So then if it happens, we have, okay, we have a decent explanation. I predicted it. But if we have a two-tailed test, then we start making up stories. So let's say we kind of thought that it would go one way, but it goes the other way. So it goes the opposite way than we, than we kind of thought. But it's still significant because it's two-tailed, because two-tailed doesn't care about whether it's more or less. It's just that the groups differ from each other. We know people start making up stories then. So if you have a two-tailed test, there could be a very big possibility of saying, yeah, I knew that would happen, and then you make up another story. Um, so... Two-tail test, I don't like so much because we have what's called a lot of post hoc explanations. I'll look at the data, and then I'll make up the story. Um, in terms of psychology, at least, we want to have a strong prediction that groups are going to differ or people are going to differ, or this variable is going to act differently with this other variable. We want to make that strong prediction and have a good argument for it. And if we're wrong, we're wrong. If it turns out to be wrong in the other direction, we can't make up a story trying to save it. So that's the difference between a one tail and a two tail. And there's different types of control conditions. So, uh, so control, we, we usually kind of imply no treatment. So control, the learning study is that we just let them do whatever they do normally. A control condition for the uh, medical thing is, is you just don't give them anything. Oftentimes, if we're looking at uh, treatments, actual treatments, let's say therapy or, or medication, we probably want a placebo. Placebo is where they think they're getting the thing, but really isn't there. Uh, again, ethically, we have to inform participants that there's a chance they'll be in a placebo group. But with the medical thing I was just talking about, so a placebo would be that they would get a pill, and they think it's in the medic medicine, at least they think there's a strong chance that there's medicine in it, but it doesn't have any medicine in it. So placebos are probably better than no treatment controls in those situations where somebody being optimistic and hopeful could actually make them better. Because if we have people take medicines, it better be doing better than a placebo effect, where people just think they're going to get better and they get better because of that uh, positivity. Same thing for therapy. I think I talked about this before. Um, but with therapy, probably you want a placebo group. Um, so placebo group in the therapy ses sessions would be that they're simply, they come in and they talk to somebody. But that person does absolutely no ther therapeutic techniques. Um, so it's just talking. Uh, so if your therapy is effective, it better be better. It better be superior 
to helping somebody with their problems than just them uh, chatting away about it. There's also this thing called wait list control. So um, whether it's the medication or the psychological therapy, you just basically say, oh yes, you signed up for the study. Um, thank you, but uh, right now we have all the slots filled. Do you mind waiting to see if anybody drops out of the study? And then what you do is whatever the length of the study is, you keep them on the wait list. Because what you're curious is, is just whether people get better over time. So like um, psychological problems, uh, for example, uh, do people just get better over time? You know, maybe you feel there's a, a crisis, but really if you just wait, everything's okay. Um, so sometimes there's this wait list control. Uh, in my opinion, um, that is a useful control group, but it's probably not as good as a placebo group because uh, the person obviously doesn't have that uh, optimism or hope, at least not to the same degree as if they're actually talking with somebody during that time period. So those are different types of control conditions. So let's delve a little bit into um, an actual example of experimental design because this will help you perhaps with your own lab exercise number two. Let's just use an example. Let's talk about beer goggles. Um, so some of you might say, oh, I know what beer goggles is. It's you put something on their goggles and it makes you see the world as if you're drunk. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about another type of beer goggles. I'm not sure if there's a different phrase. Let me know. Email me if there's a different phrase nowadays. But beer goggles are essentially um, oh, I drank so much and um, ended up uh, doing something with somebody, and I did it because I was drunk. They looked really good when I was drunk, but then when I saw them when I wasn't drunk, oh, my gosh. Um, so there's this argument that um, the more alcohol you can – putting it as a specific hypothesis, um, the more alcohol that you consume, the more attractive people are to you. So that would be a prediction, a hypothesis. There's two variables. There's alcohol consumption, and then there is attraction. More, and they're positively related. The more alcohol that you consume, the more attractive people look to you. Uh, so that is the hypothesis of the beer goggles. So the alternative hypothesis is what we just said. Higher alcohol consumption, higher attraction. No hypothesis is that alcohol consumption and attraction are not related. Remember the null hypothesis from your stats class? It's saying that there's no relationship between the variables. Normally I would do this in pairs in, in a class, in a live class, but you can just do this obviously your own, on your own. So think about an experiment where you can test out this beer goggles hypothesis. How would you do it? And obviously, we already have a specific hypothesis, so you don't need to do that. So think about this a little bit. And what I'll say is don't worry about ethics. I know that there's some ethics that would be involved in a study like this. But just let's draw out ethics. Uh, let's not worry about the ethical stuff. So remember, we're doing an experiment, so you need a true IV that you're systematically manipulating. So do your design. How would you study this? Okay, so hopefully you've jotted down your ideas. So... Let's just sort of go over some terms, and we can relate it to some of the things that you said. And what I'll do is I'll round out the discussion and say uh, typically what different students say about this in class. So dependent variable, what's the dependent variable in the study? It's attraction. It's the thing that we think is being affected. So dependent variable is attraction. Independent variable. It's the thing you're manipulating. Obviously, if you think alcohol affects attraction, alcohol should be the thing you're manipulating. And then you have different levels. So, you know, different people say different things, but um, I'll just give uh, examples that I've had. Uh, so there's zero alcohol, so zero drinks. 
Uh, sometimes students uh, recommend a placebo, so something that uh, people think is alcohol but doesn't really have any alcohol. Because, you know, just, just the idea that you're drinking and getting drunk can influence your behavior, not the alcohol per se. So oftentimes people will suggest a placebo group, and then you can say things like um, placebo versus uh, one shot versus two shots versus three shots, or one drink, two drinks, three drinks. So that can vary. So however many levels of drinks that you suggested, that's the number of levels. So if I said zero versus uh, two drinks versus four drinks, that would be three levels. Again, there's probably um, differences of control group or placebo groups. So sometimes people suggest a control group where you just don't give drinks to the person. Uh, but other students suggest a placebo group where you're giving them and they think it's a drink, but it really isn't. Probably the placebo group would be um, the better baseline comparison because I, I strongly believe, actually I think there's research that supports this, um, when people think they're drinking alcohol, they act differently even if there's no alcohol in what they're drinking. Um, internal validity. So internal validity, we talked about this before. Internal validity has to do with experimental control. So if you had a nice internally valid study that you designed, the only thing that differs is the drinks people are drinking. Nothing else should differ. And I'm guessing that you did one of two designs. And one reason I'm doing this is to have you think about these things, about what you would do first before I put terms on them. So let's look at these terms. There's between subjects and within subjects. So between subjects, if you did a between subjects design, you did something like this. You might have said, I'm going to bring people into the lab. It doesn't have to be done in the lab, by the way. You could do this in the real world if you want. It's a little bit more tricky because it's hard to manipulate alcohol. But in a lab, I can control, right? So I bring them into the lab. And I have three groups. So one group, they get um, fake alcohol. Another group, they get two drinks of alcohol. Another group, they get four drinks of alcohol. So I bring them in. I have them drink the drinks. And probably what's really tr kind of tricky is the, the zero alcohol shot should probably drink four drinks of fake alcohol. The two drinks, they should probably get two drinks of real alcohol and two drinks of the fake alcohol. This way we, we know it's the alcohol, not what they think they should act like after four drinks. And then after that happens, you might want to, you want to wait a little bit of time, right? Because the alcohol has to take effect. But then you have them uh, rate photographs. So a good way of uh, getting attraction ratings is rate photographs. So I have a bunch of photographs. And I have them rate the photographs and how attractive those photographs are. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a fairly nice design study. Um, the only thing that's differing is the level of drinks. I'm, my procedure is going to be equal across all those people. Uh, those three groups are going to see the same photos. So if there's any differences, it's not because the photos are different or the people are different that are looking at. They're seeing the same people. This is called between subjects. Why is it called between subjects? Because I'm comparing groups. So comparing groups, and nobody's in more than one group. You either are in the zero group, the two drink group, or the four drink group. Nobody's in more than one group. So what we say is we say that each person gets just one level of the IV. You either get zero drinks, two drinks, or four drinks. One of those three, that's it. You get one level. That's between subjects. <clears throat> so if you remember your independent t-test from statistics, that was a between groups design. You have different independent groups, two groups you're comparing. You have the red people, people that saw somebody in red and rated their attraction. <clears throat> and then you had different people see somebody in blue, and, or see the same person in blue, and rate their attraction. Nobody saw both red and blue. 
you're comparing red versus blue. That's an independent t-test. Also, there's like a between subjects, one-way ANOVA. So between subjects, one-way ANOVA that you learned in stats class. You're comparing more than two groups, but they're separate groups. So I have the zero drinks group, I have the two drinks group, I have the four drinks group. Separate groups. Nobody's in more than one group. I compare those groups on their attraction levels. And if four is greater than two is greater than zero, then I have support for the beer goggles hypothesis. <clears throat> so that's a common design that people have. Sometimes people come up with another design, which is called within subjects. What does within subjects mean? Well, sometimes students in my class say, well, <clears throat> we're going to bring people in. And usually it's individuals. And what we'll do is we'll give them some fake alcohol. And then we'll have them rate the attraction of some photos. So they have had zero drinks. Zero alcohol, I should say. They have some fake drinks. So they get that. And then the same person <clears throat> they give two drinks to. And then they rate the attra attraction of other photographs. You might say, well, this is weird because you don't, you don't know if those photographs are equal. You can. So uh, if I were doing a study, what I would do is I would get a ton of photographs. I would bring them to a class. And I'd say, hey, rate these photographs in terms of attraction. And so I'd have some large measure of the attraction of the different photographs from uh, people similar to what I'm studying. And I can make sure that those each group of photographs are equal on attraction levels. So they had two drinks. They'll rate another group of photographs that are equivalent attraction ratings. But we don't want to use the same photographs because when you see somebody over and over again, you, you tend to like them more in general. Uh, it's called mere exposure. Um, so when you see people more, you're more attracted. So uh, when we get back in a physical classroom, you can use this. If you think that there's somebody really cute or good looking in your class, sit next to them. And according to the theory, if you sit next to them for a while, they should start liking you. Unless you're obnoxious, then probably they, they will like you uh, even less. Uh, but if you're likable, they'll like you more just by being around you. And then <clears throat> you have the four drinks group. So. We already have two drinks in them, so all we have to do is give them two more drinks to get them to four. Then when they have had four drinks, then we have them rate the attraction of a, a equivalently rated uh, a group of photographs. So you have the same people, and you look at their attraction ratings at zero, at two, and four. So we're comparing within people, so within subjects. So the question then is, do you change? Do you individually change your ratings from no alcohol to some alcohol to more alcohol? So the comparison there is not groups of people. The comparison is within people. Do people change with more alcohol? That's within subjects. And so within subjects, you're comparing within people, and you are having every participant exposed to every level of the IV. So within subjects, everybody in your study gets exposed to every level of the IV. So in your stats class, you should have learned about pair t-test. Pair t-test is a within subjects design. So pair t-test, I'm, I'm going to show you somebody in red. I'm going to show you somebody in blue. And I'm going to pair, compare your ratings of the red person versus the blue person and see if you think the red person is more attractive than the blue. So that's within subjects. Um, also, repeated measures ANOVA. I hope that most of you learned repeated measures ANOVA. Repeated measures ANOVA is a within subjects design. So for our alcohol study, it would be repeated measures ANOVA. 
we would compare within people whether the four drinks was higher than two drinks and was higher than zero drinks within individuals. These are the two basic types of research designs, between subjects and within subjects. So there are some concerns and some sort of um, strengths and weaknesses of each. And so for between subjects design, uh, the big concern is that our groups are not equal. So in general, if we do random assignment and our group sizes are large enough, probably we don't have to worry so much about that, but there's always a concern about that. So there's always a concern that our groups may not be equivalent. Uh, one way to sort of address that, and I sort of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I mentioned about measuring. Um, so for example, if you thought that you're you're doing a learning task, but you're afraid that maybe people come in with different IQs, you can't measure IQ, but maybe you can measure GPA. Ask somebody what their overall GPA is, and you, then you can measure, you can make sure that your groups differ. Uh, another way you can do that is you can actually match groups. Um, so let's say you think you worry about GPA uh, affecting your results. And so you can do what's called match groups. So you can have GPA, you ask it, and then basically you have cutoffs. And you say, okay, these are the people that are high, have high GPAs, people that have average, people that have below average. And then what you do is you actually uh, put people in different levels of the IV based on that. So if you have people who are high on the GPA and you have two levels, put one of those high people in one level, put them in another level, and put the other one in another level. So you have the equal number of people who have high GPAs in the levels of the experiment. So you're matching them to the levels of the experiment. Same for average. So half your average people, one level, the other half of your average people in the other level. Then the below average, half of those people in one level, half of those people in the other level. So you've actually systematically assigned people. And you, by the way, you randomly assign them. So if half are going there, half are going there, those the random assignment happens and that split. Uh, but what's not random, what's systematic is you make sure that GPA level is distributed equally across your two levels. That's called match design. So if you can measure something that you think will influence the results, you can actually make sure that there's an equal number of people at different levels of that within your experimental levels. So you have the same number of high in each, same number of average in each, same number of below average in each, and therefore uh, GPA, uh, economic achievement, should not differ across your groups. Within, um, what's really good about the within is it controls for participant variables. So all those things that people can bring into the study, whether it's personality or whether they broke up with somebody or not, or whether they had a good day, bad day, all of these things the person brings into the study that can influence the results, it doesn't matter because each person is their own control. The groups don't differ because there's no groups. Each person, we don't care about where you start. So let's say that I'm doing the attraction stuff. And again, we know that people are picky or not picky. And I think I'm going to write this out. Just give me a second. So uh, with the uh, with, uh, uh, within subjects, we don't care about where you start. So differences with picky and not picky people, we don't really care because all we care is how you change. And so in this study, we had the um, the zero group, right, or not, I shouldn't say zero, zero level. So everybody comes in, they get zero drinks, or they get zero alcohol, they rate the attraction. They get two drinks, they rate the attraction. They drink two more drinks, they're at four drinks, We rate, they get their attraction ratings done there. We don't care where you start, so you could be a picky person. And you start with two. We don't care about that. We care about, care about the change. So if we had something like that, well, 
maybe there's a difference. Maybe alcohol does increase in traction because we have a plus two, if you will. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in repeated measures, but you can just think from zero to four, we went up two. And then maybe we have a not picky person. They start with an eight. But it doesn't matter. All we care about is the change. So although you might say, oh, these are totally different things. No, they're not. In terms of within subjects, these two people are exactly the same. Each person went up two points from zero to four. So this is what we, why we say that each person is their own control group, because we don't care where you start. We don't care if you're picky or not picky, because it doesn't matter. What matters is the change over the IV levels, and that's what we're looking at in the within subjects design. So uh, it, it takes a lot of um, noise, so-called noise, out. We don't have to worry about whether people are picky or not picky, because each person, we only care about how they change in our study. The nice thing about that is we need fewer subjects. So um, basically, we need half or a third of the subjects that we would need for between groups. Because if you did between groups design or between subjects design, you have to have enough people in each of the groups. So if you have two groups, you better have, let's say, 20 in each group. That's 40 people. You can get the same amount of data with 20 people in a within subjects design. Because you have 20 people, you measure them twice. You have four data points. You have four data points on attraction. Or, I'm sorry, 40 data points on attraction overall. 20 people, you measure them twice on attraction. You have 40 data points. You had 40 data points with 40 people in the between subjects. So you actually need less subjects. Also, you have more statistical power, and I hope you learned this in your stats class. Actually, I'm going to go to the drawing here. And I always hit this ruler by accident. Let's erase this. And maybe let's expand this so we have a little bit more space to write. And I'll just contrast this. And we're, we're just going to look at this from a... Um, well, this works both ways conceptually. Um, so in statistics, we want to find out the variance that we can predict in our dependent variable based on our independent variables. So in a between subjects design, so here's our all of our variance in our dependent variable. Let's say it's attraction. And then we have our IV. We have our independent variable. Uh, so let's say it's color in this case. So we know there's going to be some sort of overlap between the two. And statistically, the relationship between the IV and DV is this. And if you remember your statistics, basically, this is the top part of your formula. Whether it's a t-test or an f, it doesn't really matter. This is the variance that's directly linked from the dv to the iv. And then you have an error term. So all of this stuff is the error term. So this is the bottom part of your formulas, whether it's your t-test or your f-test. So the error term is we don't know. People are differing in terms of their attraction. But it's not because of color. It's because of some other things. We don't know. We call that error. And in statistics, regardless of what the statistic is, this is beyond t-test and, and f-test, but t-test and f-test is certainly true. We basically have the effect of our IV on top, which is sort of this part conceptually right here. And then we have the error on the bottom. So our statistics are that. So basically, the larger this is, the top, compared to this, the more likely our statistics significant. So the more of the dependent variable that you can predict with the independent variable in relationship to what you don't know what's going on to your dependent variable, the better that ratio is, the higher that ratio is, your IV to the error, the more likely their statistic is significant. So we have sort of a similar thing with the, this is between subjects. 
This is between subjects design. So within subjects, we have the same start. We still have the, and if you remember your statistics, um, like your repeated measures, your repeated measures, ANOVA, you do the same calculations to figure out this stuff. So this is, a, actually, I'm going to make this bigger. Sorry about that. It's nice to have these circles be a little bit bigger. So roughly the same relationship. I'm going to make them a little bit bigger because I want to draw something else here. So roughly the same proportion of IV, DV, I'm sorry, IV air here. Uh, so we have the DV. And this is variance in the DV, so in this case, attraction. And then we have our color. Color is the IV. And we know that there's some part of attraction that's directly linked to our independent variable. We can test that with our statistics. So we still have that with, within subjects, but then we have something else. Then we know that there is some part of this picture that we have individual differences. So there's some part of this picture where we have individual differences. So we know now that there's something about people that makes them different in terms of their attraction ratings. We actually measured that. And there's a little bit of that that overlaps with the dependent variable variance. So there's, so there's some part of attraction that was related to these individual differences in people. So individual differences, some people gave higher scores, some people gave lower scores, some people gave scores in the middle. We actually know that because we have their scores. So we actually are able to shrink that part where we don't know what's going on with the DV. So you know with the between subjects, this is pretty big. It's whatever the IV doesn't explain is the leftover is the error. Here, the error is smaller because we have more explanation here. We know there's something about the DV that is individual differences. So now our error goes down. The stuff about the dependent variable attractions that we don't know what's going on is smaller now because we know some of it is individual differences. So our statistic has the same ratio of the IV and error. It takes a while to write this because I'm writing on a, a laptop pad. But basically our error goes down. Our error goes down. The error goes down because of this. This stuff right here. There's some part of attraction that we know is individual differences. We know what's going on. So the question mark is smaller you know, within subjects design. So this gives us more power. If our error goes down, the chance of finding this to be significant goes up. And we say that the power goes up. So if you remember from your stats class, the ability to find an effect that is really there is called power. So we increase our power here. We're more likely to find a significant result because we reduce the error because of this overlap with individual differences. I'm going to erase this a little bit. You might think, oh, well, just wait. I can't quite follow this. I don't know exactly um, why the error goes down. I'm going to show you here in a second. It takes a while to erase this individually. I want to keep the other part so that we have this together. So remember that we had in the... Within subjects design, we had measure of attraction at zero, measure of attraction at two, measure of attraction at four. And I mentioned that we didn't care where you started. Uh, we cared about where you ended up. So you do you change over time? I had these numbers. Yes, that's true. So in terms of the effect of the IV, we care about how you change, not where you start. But what you do also is you can add these together. So if you remember your repeated measures, ANOVA, you added it and you made it into a p-score. So this person has 8. 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 4 is 8. This person, 8 plus 8 plus 10. So we have a whopping 26. 
This is how we can tell individual differences. This person's p-score is pretty low. They're pretty picky. In general, they give low scores. This person's p-score is 26. They're very much not picky. They give high scores in general, regardless of the condition. So we can take those p-measures, basically your scores in general, and determine your individual differences. Determine whether you're very picky or very much not picky. And then we can link that to your attraction ratings and, you know, at least a decent part of those attraction ratings are related to these tendencies. Your general tendency to be low, general tendency to be high. So that's how we reduce the errors because, because we've repeatedly measured you. We know whether you are low in general or high in general. You can't do that with between subjects because you only measure each person once. In between subjects. Between subjects, you only are exposed to one level of the IV. So basically, you only have one score on the DV. You can't tell whether somebody is picky or not picky with a between subjects. Within subjects, we can tell. We can tell, we can relate that to your attraction ratings, and that reduces the error. That increases our power, our ability to find a significant result. There is, uh, so that's the positive stuff of within subjects. Within subjects also has some uh, negative things. So there's this thing called order effects. So order effects is that seeing something's going to influence your rating on another thing. So if I see red and then blue, probably my blue attraction rating is going to be affected by seeing red first. And vice versa, if I see blue and then red, my attraction ratings for red probably is influenced by seeing the blue first. So that's the order effect, quite simply put. Doing something with one level is going to affect your behavior with the next level. Uh, how we uh, rectify that is we do counterbalancing, which we'll talk about later, but since we're here, we'll just talk about it. Counterbalancing is one way to get uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. What you do is half the people, if you do it within subjects, half see red and then blue. Half see blue and then red. So if there's any sort of carryover effects, they should equalize between the two. There's also fatigue effects. So sometimes um, people just get sick of doing the thing, especially if you have a lot of levels. <laughs> so if they're just doing it over and over again, they're, they're going to be tired and that's going to affect their behavior in later rounds, later levels of the IV and that's a problem. Uh, there's various carryover effects so it's a more specific type of order effect. Um, and so uh, remember order effects, early conditions affect the behavior in later condition. You can think about it simply if you see red it's going to affect how you think about blue. If you see blue it's going to affect how you think about red. Um, types of carryover effects include practice effects. So sometimes uh, people change their behavior just because they're doing the same thing over and over again. Sometimes you might think, oh, practice effects are probably things like learning because if you keep on doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to learn it, you could get better. But it applies to other things. I'd say even with attraction ratings. So remember we were talking about attra uh, the attraction ratings. We might have a group of photos. We might not have just one, one photo. And so let's say we do the within subjects, we have zero drinks, two drinks, four drinks, and we probably want a group of photos at each level so we get a nice measure of attraction. Well, guess what? When people are doing that, sometimes they change their criteria. So when they, when they first rate somebody's attraction, they're like, maybe they're maybe a little bit more sloppy in general. Like, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. But then they're, as they're doing it, they're, they might start thinking, hey, am I supposed to pay attention to some things more? And so you might end up with people looking differently. Well, I'm going to look at how they're dressed, or I'm, I'm going to look at the symmetry of their face, and I'm going to look at this. And so sometimes when you have people do the same thing over and over again, they change how they do it. And that's a problem because if they change how they do something, the differences you see in the attraction ratings, for example, could be just that change, and it's not actually the IV. So we have to be careful about practice effects. Um, so I could call this also in terms of changing criteria. Um, so that attraction example I gave, people are changing their criteria. 
This also happens in things like um, judging guilt. So a lot of uh, studies in psychology and the law, they have what's called fake juries. And so they'll present evidence to the participant that a jury would see, and then they would have the, the person make some sort of judgments about guilt of the person. And sometimes they do it as a within subjects design. Uh, the problem with that is that for person number one that they see, how they judge guilt might change with the second presentation. So the second person, they might judge their guilt on based different criteria. Um, in general, um, that's not a big deal if you can counterbalance. Uh, so if people do change their criteria for being guilty, uh, if you counterbalance, they should be equalized across the conditions. But basically, anything where you have um, people trying to judge something, and by judge, I'm not saying guilt, but it could be uh, how attractive somebody is, how favorable this um, brand is, uh, how much would you buy this uh, product. You know, there's all sorts of things that uh, you make judgments about. So I mentioned counterbalancing already. So you just counterbalance it. Uh, half the people see red first and then blue. The other half see blue, then red. That's counterbalancing. Uh, complete counterbalancing is you have all possible combinations, it gets a bit messy because three conditions, it's not so bad, but even with three conditions, so let's say that we have red, green, and blue. So we have just three colors. That leads to needing six combinations. This, These would be all the combinations to make sure that red, green, and blue are all shuffled and equal in terms of where they occur in the presentation. But you can see here, you know, you, with just three conditions, you have six. If you have four conditions, it multiplies even further. So if you go beyond three conditions, it gets really tough. And so the solution is this. So Latin square design is a way to counterbalance in a way that you don't need so many different possible combinations. So you're not doing all possible combinations, you're just doing a shortcut which makes sure that everything is counterbalanced. It's like a Sudoku puzzle. So if you know Sudoku, you can only have the number once in each row and each column. So A, B, C, D here are our levels of the IV. So we have four levels of the IV here. So let's say maybe it's red, green, uh, blue, and yellow. And so we have four colors. Each color is a is a letter: red, blue, green, yellow. And it's like a Sudoku puzzle. A only occurs once in each row, in each column. A once, row, column. A once, row, column, etc. So for every single letter, there is just it once in each row and in each column. What's good about this? Well, what's good about this is that make sure that each level, each color in this case, is at each ordinal position. So red is first, once, twice. I'm sorry, red is first once, red is first twice, once. I should say, sorry, red is first here, red is second here, red is third, red is four. And that only happens once for red. So Red is first once, twice once, third once, fourth once. So each condition is in each ordinal position. That's good because if there's any order effects, we want to make sure that each condition is in one of those places once. And then each condition proceeds and follows the other condition one time. So A proceeds B once. A doesn't proceed B here. It actually happens here at least one time. It can happen more than once, though. Um, so A is before B at least one time. B is before A at least one time. Uh, A is before C once or twice. And C is before A twice. 
So you can see here that we, we, we make sure that each condition precedes another condition at least once, and it follows a condition at least once. So B follows A, I'm sorry, A follows B once, A follows C, just looking here, twice, A follows D at least once or twice. So we make sure that um, there's at least a representation for something coming before the condition and something coming after the condition. So if we were going to do this with four conditions, I believe we would need 16 possibilities. Um, certainly we have just four possibilities here, which is good because with three conditions we needed six possibilities. So with four conditions, we actually just need four possibilities with the Latin square design. So that's what Latin square design is. It's not perfect. We can see that some things follow some things more than other things, but we just make sure that at least once we have a have those things occurring. At least once the condition precedes another condition, and at least once it follows the condition. It's not perfect, but it is a good solution to not having to have so many different uh, testing possibilities within your experiment. And there's different, two different ways of looking at counterbalancing. So counterbalancing, we can see that it equalizes the order effects. But also we can think about, maybe there's an interesting possibility here that we can look at uh, whether there's something to the order effects. So is there some sort of priming going on, for example? So if we are primed to think about certain aspects of a situation, let's say it's a, um, a, a jury situation where you're presented with the evidence to a jury, from a, to a jury and you need to make a guilty verdict, we can not only counterbalance just to make sure that um, things don't influence each other, but let's say that we have differences in race or gender and, eth uh, uh, gender and ethnicity um, in terms of the, the stimuli, the people that are under trial. We might want to see if there's a priming effect. Does the judgments of guilt depend on the gender or the race of the person that they saw previously in the previous case? So I would say that it's not just something to equalize the order effects, but you can actually look at things interestingly to see if there's some priming going on. Another sort of uh, problem with the within subject design is that people can guess your hypothesis more easily because they're repeatedly doing something. So typically what you do in a within subject design is if, if, it's, if there's a lot of things they need to do for it, you might have distraction task. And I'd say that's relatively common. So um, a distraction task is where they do something else. It's actually not part of the study. All you're trying to do is trying to create some interference, uh, try to break that connection between the two things that they're doing. So if you're doing two things, two different levels in your within subject design, put a distraction task in between those two things to throw them off the scent so that they can't guess your hypothesis. Just checking our progress. And we've been talking about traditional within subjects design where we test one condition at a time. Uh, there's another design. It's called simultaneous within subjects design. The definition of this is that you have multiple responses in each test. So let's just sort of say that we have this um, law and psychology study and we're curious about whether uh, we judge people differently, whether they're attractive or unattractive in terms of their guilt. So what you can do, you could have conditions in the traditional within subject design where you have attractive persons and you make their make guilt judgments and then you see unattractive persons that would be the traditional design if you do a simultaneous within subject design you could have 10 for example attractive defendants 10 unattractive and you can shuffle them 
So instead of doing attractive first and then unattractive and then counterbalance it, you just shuffle them in. So you shuffle in the attractive and unattractive defendants, and then you make those have the person do 20 judgments of guilt, but there's a within subject design built in there. But you're not presenting them as separate parts. They're all shuffled together. That's simultaneous within subjects design. So what should you use? Should you use between subjects or within subjects? Well, you know, you can say, well, between subjects are good because it avoids order effects and I'm not going to have my people get fatigued and they're not going to guess my hypothesis. But, you know, the within, you, you can use fewer participants. Uh, you have more power. You control the participant variables. You have a measure of it. Um, so by control, we say we measure it and we can actually take it out of the air. So that gives, gives us more power. So uh, both of them have some attraction. Uh, but in general, the rule of thumb is use within if there's no serious order effects. And you can proper counterbalance. By the way, if we look back at our alcohol study, zero drinks, two drinks, four drinks, it's a little bit hard for us to counterbalance. The drinks are already in them. <laughs> and we don't want to bring them back on different days, right? So we don't, we can't like do a, come on in and we'll give you four drinks and come back tomorrow, I'll give you zero. Come back the next day, I'll give you two. That would be very um, much a waste of time and you might not get, well, I was going to say, maybe you don't get people back, but if you're giving them drinks, maybe free drinks, they'll come back. Um, but, you know, we can't counterbalance it. We can't shuffle it. We can't have them sit down one time and uh, I guess we could, but it takes very long to, you know, give them four drinks and, okay, sit here for um, 10 hours, please, so that the alcohol gets out of your system. That's not that feasible, right? So... Within, go for it. If there's no serious order effects, you can do proper counterbalancing. But if it's difficult to do those things, to do that within design, then go for the between subjects. That's basically the rule of thumb. So I'm going to uh, end this first part of the lecture. I'm going to make a second part of the lecture uh, after this. Um, but I'm going to end this first part of the lecture with lab exercise number two. So lab exercise number two is due uh, week number three, the Wednesday of week number three. So you should be watching this video during week number two. Uh, so you should have ample time to do this lab exercise. So in lab exercise number two, I want you to choose one of your research questions. This is one of your research questions from your research project based on one of the four data sets that we have. And think about a simple experimental design for each design. So I want to actually, for each design. And I kind of want to flip this, so sorry about this. I changed this in the, in the actual lab, but I didn't change it here. I want to change it here to reflect the lab. I use design twice here in each, so don't worry about it because it's a little bit, because you want to you wanna design this. So suggest a simple experimental design for each, each I'm going to say approach. Sorry about this thing on the fly. For each approach. So what I want you to do is for one of your research questions, do an experiment, a simple experimental design for with a between subjects design. And then for that same research question, suggest a within subjects design. So for that, so it's only for one of your questions. You don't need to do it for all. Just select one of your research questions. Do a simple experimental design using between subjects. And then also do a simple experimental design for within subjects. And that should not be so complicated because you're probably having the same independent variable for both. It's just how you design it is differently. It's different, I should say. And then for each of the between subjects and within subjects design, which is probably going to be similar, specify your IV and your dependent variable and any predictor variable that you have. So in the actual lab, I'll show you the lab. So here's lab exercise two. I'm going to post this as an assignment in week number three. 
It says to make sure to watch this video. Congratulations, you've done that. It says the same thing. Choose one of your research questions. Suggest a simple experimental design. Design it for both a between subjects and a within subjects design. I'm going to change this. Uh, specify the IV and any PV. And then you can approach this in different ways. Um, but I'm guessing that at least some of you are going to have research questions where everything's a PV. So something that you can't manipulate. So what I'll say is if each of your variables in your research question is a predictor variable that you can't manipulate, just think about possible ways to bring out larger differences that's represented in your research question. So what do I mean by that? So if you remember, I could have a research question that says, narcissists are more aggressive than non-narcissists. That's my research question. So if I, let's say I was you and I come to this lab and say, I can't do anything, I can't do an experiment, I can't manipulate whether somebody's narcissistic or not. Well, I can think about an experiment where I can bring out these differences more. So if you remember, I talked about uh, false feedback. So false feedback is, is one way to have an IV. And false feedback is simply you have somebody do a task, and you're not really evaluating the task. In fact, you probably don't even know what the standards are. Uh, but you give the person false feedback. The person does something, and you say, oh my gosh, you were really fast, and you were faster than 90% of the people. So you're in the top 10%. Um, or the other level is you did really bad. You were really slow. You were slower than 90% of the people, so you're the lower 10%. So that's the independent variable. That independent variable is used because we know that narcissists become basically become aggressive when you threaten their ego. If you kiss their ass and you say you're, they're fantastic, they love you. If you say any small little thing that they think is critical of them, they're going to cut your head off if they can. And so this is a good example. My research question was narcissism is related to aggression. We have a questionnaire. We measured narcissism. We have a questionnaire. We measured aggression. Predictor variables. How am I supposed to do an experiment? Well, think about an experiment where I can think about where can I really get these people to act the most aggressive. Under what circumstances would narcissists act most aggressive? And I'll manipulate that circumstance. Here I'll manipulate threatening their ego by giving false feedback. So that's an example of how I can take a research question that is a predictor variable based and think about doing an experiment that will bring out those differences more in certain situations. So if I was doing this, you know, I could do a between subjects and within between. I would have uh, narcissists who have the ego threat, narcissists who don't have the ego threat, non-narcissists, ego threat, non-narcissists, ego threat. Um, that would be by uh, between uh, subjects. So there's actually be, uh, for example, four groups there. I could do it within subjects. So for narcissist and non-narcissist, I could have an ego threat condition and a non-ego threat condition. So for both narcissist and non-narcissist, they would undergo ego threat, measure their aggression, undergo uh, something that's neutral or positive, good feedback, uh, measure their aggression. And then IV, DV, PV. So IV would be my ego threat. So um, specifically the levels would be uh, the false feedback, uh, negative false feedback versus positive false feedback. So that's my levels, two levels of the IV. My DV would be aggression. That's the outcome I'm looking at. The predictor variable be, would be narcissism because ultimately I want to compare narcissist and non-narcissist to see if they differ under these two conditions. So PV would be narcissism because that's something that I'm not manipulating but I think is going to influence the aggression findings, the DV. And then the final part of the lab is I want you to evaluate each of your designs. So you have a between subject design, you have a within subject design, evaluate each of those designs in terms of their strengths and their weaknesses. So between what's the strength of your design, what's your limitation of that design, your within 
design? What's the strength of it? What's the limitation? And just like with any other lab, you can type your answers directly onto the sheet if you want, or if you want to type a, type a separate sheet, that's fine with me also. And upload that typed document up into Canvas. Remember that Canvas cannot read pages, so submit only a Word document format or PDF. I will record the second part of this lecture in a bit. Talk to you then.